Miguel Pérez Milans, Professors Manuel Alcantara, David Poveda, and other members of the executive board. To my fellow presenter, Luis Paulo Moita, it's a pleasure to meet you, and I look forward to your words. To the students in the audience, it is an honor to address you today. You bring us so much hope. I want to start by acknowledging that um, the long struggle that many European countries, and in particular, have waged against COVID-19. You show the rest of the world how to fight and keep standing. We listened and watched you clap at night in late March to honor the health and medical workers, even as you were suffering irreparable loss of life. My condolences to you who lost loved ones. We did not know then that New York would be forced to also fall to its knees before this heartless monster. I'm going to be sharing the screen, so I'm going to do that now. Um, I am speaking to you from my home, roughly six blocks from the UC Berkeley campus, on the territory of Uchin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Mowekma Ohlone tribe and the descendants of the Verona Band. I, along with other members of the UC Berkeley community, through this land acknowledgement, not only recognize the history of the land on which we stand, but we also recognize that the Mowekma Ohlone people are alive and that they are flourishing members of the Berkeley and surrounding community today. As settlers, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship and responsibility to native peoples. I am a settler in this land. I am of indigenous Arab and European ancestry. My ancestors come from indigenous Maya lands in Yucatan, the southern part of Mexico, the Lebanese diaspora of the Americas and from Spain. Like many immigrants and displaced people, I grew up in a family full of secretive past and open dreams, neither from here nor there, always on the move. I spoke Spanish growing up, but that language was slo slowly replaced by English. I'm learning French, I'm learning Yucatec Maya. As an immigrant in the United States, I have been labeled as Hispanic, Latina, now Latinx, and slowly embracing the new category of indigenous Latinx. I marvel at the language we create to redefine us, at the way we work to create belonging, but to also ways in which we build walls to keep each other apart. So before I turn further into a meditation on this very point, I want to very quickly signal, because I know this is a school, that, um, that there are parts to my talk. In the first part of my remarks, I address the racialized and racializing context in which we do our work. I will then share a bit of some of my recent work with indigenous students and families at a primary school in San Francisco, a case study of racialization and of indigeneity in motion. And finally, I return to the question of race in our fields in the hopes of inviting dialogue and moving forward as we imagine a new, as we imagine a different way to do our work. Eight minutes and 46 seconds have come to redefine racial experience in the United States. It represents a time just under 10 minutes when George Floyd was denied breathing life by a team of aggressive Minneapolis police. Eight minutes and 46 seconds represents the long durée that Fernand Broder asked us to, to understand, quote, Beneath the cycles and structural crises lie old attitudes of thought and action, resistant frameworks dying hard at times against all logic, end quote. The set of attitudes that coalesced at the corner of East 38th Street and Chicago Avenue near Cup Foods, a neighborhood market store in South Minneapolis, was for lack of better words, tragically mundane. Two young and inexperienced store workers questioned the possible counterfeit $20 bill used in an otherwise ordinary transaction involving the purchase of a pack of cigarettes. What fueled that motivation to tell? 
What pushes someone to call the police on a black man? What moved a policeman to descend on the scene to restrain a black man with such force and callousness to bring about his death? George Floyd's death has come to represent the epitome of anti-blackness, the repeated assault on the humanity of black people, an example of a long, long durée of assaults on the black body. This second pandemic, as it has been so aptly termed, reminds us of how the color of our skin articulates, to use Goffman's terms, although absent in the original paradigm, a set of participant frameworks historically preconditioned into a new arrangement as victims, perpetrators, and witnesses, and in so doing, realizing agentivities built on privilege, guilt, and fear. The response to the killing of George Floyd has redirected energies to intersecting social movements, including Black Lives Matter, anti-police terror, and in social media, hashtag Black Twitter, are more relevant to academics, posed by black students and academics and hashtag black, black in the ivory, have offered insightful, painful commentary on the blatant anti-blackness and white supremacy in our academic practices. I take the contradiction between this long racialized disposition and my urge to race against time to be a necessary way to address what is becoming clearer across many facets of social experience today and for our participants, us participants in this summer school, about the need to radically shift our work. There is no return to things as they were that we must imagine anew. In our fields, we have not paid sufficient attention to the ingrained processes of racialization in the work we read, in the work we cite, and the methods and theories in which we do our work. This moment of reckoning asked us to resist the arc of reproductive work that has safeguarded the power of those in, of a few in the academy and has created theoretical paradigms that can be anti-black, anti-indigenous at their core. We are at that point to answer the call of Unangash scholar Eve Tuck and my former student Kaywin Yang when they asked in their chapter label R words refusing research in the anthology um, humanizing research edited by Django Paris and Maisha Wynn. They asked us to rethink research along three axioms. The first, the subaltern can speak. Second, there are forms of knowledge that the academy doesn't deserve. And three, research may not be the intervention that is needed. There was resonate strongly with my own academic upbringing and socialization. I was educated at the University of California, Los Angeles in a program that no longer exists, Applied Linguistics. Thank Mary Ann Seltz Murcia, John Schumann, Roger Anderson. It was a deeply second language acquisition program. Um, and actually more important for me then, there were very few people who looked like me, both on the student body or the faculty. But the program made it possible for doctoral students to be trained across disciplinary Discipline, disciplines, and that is why my entire coursework was in linguistic anthropology and affiliated with the program there and trained under the supervision of Eleanor Oakes, who remains my dear friend and mentor. And while learning under these amazing scholars was a fabulous experience, the trainer did not exactly speak to the reasons I and others were in the academy. Anti-blackness pervaded the curriculum and as it continues to do so across many academic programs addressing language, culture, and learning. And so literally under the cover of night, a group of us doctoral students in linguistic anthropology created our own learning program. So I'm gonna share the screen here. Doesn't let me move, let me see, yes, aha. Uh -huh. We called ourselves the Dyer Collective. And our goal was to raise funds to bring speakers of color, junior anthropologists to our campus. And so it was that our first guest was a doctoral student at Stanford, finishing her dissertation on girls who were gang members. She was Norma Mendoza Lent, and soon others were invited. We were interested in blurring anthropological lines of studying the distant other and making the familiar strange. We wanted to do research in our communities and speak from that voice. My doctoral training was equally informed by the work of these peer scholars 
who went on to produce really impactful and inspiring work in the field. They included Adrian Lowe, Alanita Jacobs, Kikiwis, many others. It is not difficult for me to imagine that perhaps some of the scholars of color present today hear that Ediso itself is a place of imagination to do for doing similar tactics, tactics of refusal. The training and influence of the Dyer Collective placed me on a trajectory of projects that look squarely at the intersection of race, language, socialization, and education, which motivated my first studies of religious socialization among Mexican immigrant children. And that centers my recent work on indigenous Maya students from Yucatan, Mexico, um, to understand processes of diasporic community and return migration. Um, I want to say too that I say all this because following and understanding Sadia Harman, our own stories, they're not personal stories that fold onto itself. It's not about navel gazing. It's really about trying to locate ourselves historically and in social processes. And one's perspective is part of these social and historical processes in our own lives are examples of these processes. So it is method as well as theory. Um, I'm going to leave these um, slides for a little bit because I'm going to talk a little more about my research in the next few minutes. Um, for the past 10 years, I have been leading a research program, a project and partnership at an elementary school I call Metropolitan Elementary in the Mission District to protect the identities of students who are vulnerable given their citizen status um, of their families. The project is in the Mission District of San Francisco. So if you, don't, if you know the city, you, you would know that the Mission District is, is a um, highly um, an immigrant location where a lot of Latinx immigrants from Central America and Mexico live. As a professor of education, I was particularly interested in understanding and facilitating ways to navigate the bureaucracies of the public school district. Um, I was interested in understanding the socialization into academic and linguistic practices and entry into the school system. This particular group of immigrants in, um, in, in the city, and I want to make sure that I say that well, I share similar experiences in some contexts, in particular, the stigmatization of indigenous people in Mexico. I am aware of vastly different histories of migrations that I have and that the participants in this study have. So I'm very mindful of, of making this distinction in my work. Um, this group of immigrants is experiencing relocation due to the collapse of certain industries in Yucatan, in particular the sisal rope industry, and, and, and also due to failed efforts of neoliberal market economies advanced and abandoned by the North American Trade Agreement. Working with indigenous people across diaspora has been important too for reframing questions of place, space, and belonging. There's already a robust and substantive body of research addressing indigeneity mobilities, diasporas, including many theories in Latin America and from oceanic studies in particular. I wanna add more information here, but I add, I'm happy to share resources with you. And I don't know if I, that I need to explain to this group the meaning of diaspora, but I would only say that I use it to indicate the movement of people by force or choice from one nation state to another. As James Clifford noted, groups in diaspora, quote, work to maintain community selectively preserving and recovering traditions, customizing, versioning them in novel, hybrid, and often antagonistic situations, end quote. But more recently, the work of Winnie Bago and Ojibwe, Ojibwe native, native scholar, Renia Ramirez, extend this notion to native diaspora, to include landless natives, imagining and maintaining connections with their tribal nations. Such native diasporic consciousness includes, um, uh, lost my place, feelings of connection to spaces, to land, to other native peoples, prompting people to create native hubs and develop a hub consciousness, maintained through relationships, events, rituals, and celebrations. This framing of a native hub explains the movement, the gatherings that I have witnessed from indigenous Maya people in San Francisco. 
And central to my work is that also an understanding that indigenous migrants from Yucatan already forced out of their lands as a result of Spanish colonial rule in the 15th century continue to live within the structure of a colonial formation based primarily on settler land appropriation as Lorenzo Veracini tells us and, uh, and Patrick both articulated. In this sense, indigenous communities, indigenous people are still experiencing the structures of domination that dictate and enforce control of behavior from restrictions on mobility to norms of language use, what to speak, when to speak and how to speak. Public attention was first drawn to immigrants from Yucatan in San Francisco through cover stories in local newspapers such as The Newest San Franciscans or La Nueva Migración Indígena Los Mayas de San Francisco or films such as El Recorrido which discuss the economic precarities experiences by Maya immigrants. The fact is that migration to San Francisco from Yucatan has been an ongoing phenomenon since the last mid-century with the Bracero program, the U.S. guest worker program, which recruited Mexican labor to support the U.S. economy during and after World War II. And one finds that within this population, there are multiple immigrant statuses from documented, undocumented to mixed status, family situations from nuclear extended transnational, as well as economic levels from service labor, manual managers, business owners, and unemployed. But the newspaper stories print um, point to a set of anxieties about the other, yet another group coming in. These anxieties continue to also be experienced in Yucatan, where a struggle for indigenous recognition against the erasure is still going on even today. Here is a local newspaper headline that I read on a trip to Yucatan a couple of years ago. The headline underscores to me in quite sensational ways the death of Maya people. That says it's a climate change brought about the death of the Maya. Um, that is like not true. To those of us working with indigenous populations from Latin America, it has been helpful to think at the hemispheric scale, following Latin Americanist Gutierrez Najera, Castellanos and Aldama, the reconceptualization of migration of displaced people as hemispheric, not just transnational or binational or transregional. It allows us to examine new types of indigeneity and how new subjectivities reorder and redefine belonging and place. My work with Maya students and immigrant families in the United States has reintroduced me to processes of erasure in the classificatory practices that invisibilize a myriad of Latinidades that include people of Afro descent, mestizos, indigenous, and members of other racial groups, different regions, different areas. The language itself the gender binary in the Spanish morphology of Latina, Latino, erases genders, sexualities, trans and non-conforming genders. This is of course compounded when we work and engage the work of scholars from Latin America where Latino or Latinx are not terms with much currency. So I find helpful the critique against the un unexamined use of Latinx offered by indigenous scholars mainly Blackwell, Florida, Floridalma, Bojo Lopez, and Luis Urrieta in an essay in a special issue in Latino studies last year. They advanced the concept of critical Latinx indigeneities as an analytic for accomplishing two very important actions. The first, to understand locally how indigeneity is constructed within and during difficult legacies of powers, racism, sexism, and coloniality. And the second, to avoid naturalizing displacement. For these authors argue, in the context of hemispheric migration, indigenous people become settlers in the land of other indigenous people. This is a complicated situation. And elsewhere I, ha elsewhere I have argued that it's important to recognize that indigenous people's migration as both response and resistance to settler tactics as many indigenous people still live, multiple disarticulations within the structure of a colonial formation. This disarticulation is real. In the following excerpt that I will show you is an excerpt from a, a transcribed interview with one indigenous parent at Metropolitan Elementary. It will give us an insight into how identity, politics, and migration is experienced at the school. So we asked Emma, how she responded typically, and how she identified herself to others. And she said, 
Pues yo soy como maya, yo creo, yo soy de la cultura maya, o oh, I can't see, este, maya. Yo nací con mis abuelos que eran puro maya. Siempre decimos que somos latinas. Mucha gente no sabe, bueno, al principio cuando nacimos de maya, mucha gente me decía, no son latinas. Pues así se me quedó, pues soy latina. Right? So I will, know, I will not go deeper into this quote. Um, we could perhaps do this as another point in the conference, but I just want to point out to the racialized and sedimented notion of purity, which signals this woman's understanding of and struggle for authenticity, a double consciousness regarding the external imposition of a new identity category in the reframing of her identity by others, no, you are Latina. Like in other anti-indigenous actions at schools where the rich linguistic diversity of indigenous families is not known nor harnessed. And I reference here the work of Margarita Machado Casas in North Carolina, who looked at six different school districts, identified 16 different indigenous languages from Latin America. None of them were noticeable to teachers and none of them made part, were part of the curriculum. So similarly at the school, there are different, there are processes that are taking place that are worth examining. Um, indigenous students, whether born in Yucatan or in the US are immediately classified as language learners upon enrollment. I'm gonna go to the next slide. Um, enrollment at the school. Um, through an official home language survey. In this, indigenous students then undergo a process of Latinization, often Mexicanization, and also a type of misrepresentation that Rebecca Campbell Montalvo calls linguistic reformation, which officially codifies the reporting of languages spoken by students into European languages and existing ethno-racial categories at the school. Moreover, as it has become customary and rather unofficial, students are given an individualized education plan, originally intended for students with disabilities, in effect tracking them into special education services so that the school can receive additional funds. Here, labeling processes become increasingly high stakes, resulting in lower rates of redesignation as fluent English proficient and higher chances for students to incorrectly remain placed in the category of long-term English learners, which as Monica Diana Brooks explains, is a racialization process that reinterprets these students' language abilities in schools and positions them, positions them according to their perceived race. This is the process where racial linguistic ideologies, which Nelson Flores and Jonathan Rosa examine, marking multilingual or potentially multilingual students as monolingual speaking Spanish. Needless to say, there are no language programs in Yucatec Maya at the school, except for the short-term program interventions that my team and our partnership has established between the university and the school to bring opportunities to learn and practice Maya at the school. We administered our own language background questionnaire, which revealed that the Maya speaking population at the school is roughly 25%. And we are surprised that, as I said before, that such linguistic diversity matters very little at the school. So parents often mention their own linguistic insecurities as speakers of Maya, but students, take on a different form of identity politics. They perform differently. In an interview with Nancy, who was in the fifth grade, a member of my research team asked her if she knew the meaning of indigenous and if she would identify as indigenous. And she responded, um, yes, indigenous is the person who speaks Maya. The Indians who come to the United States like my mother. And are you indigenous? Only half because I have my mother's blood, but I was born here. I am in the in-between, in the middle. Despite the rather you know, interesting blood quantum reference here by Nancy, the interview evolved into several instances of Nancy's affirmation, of playing with the language, of engaging with Maya in ways that echo the work of Virginia Zavala and Quechua youth 
who reclaimed language in their own terms. Another student joined in and explained how her own translanguage and languaging practices work. And she said, there is this language that I cannot memorize. It is almost like the language from Yucatan, but it is a little different and it's similar to Spanish, but I don't know what it's called. And it, is it not Maya? No. And is it not Spanish? It's almost like Spanish. And so who, who uses it? Where have you heard it? Oh, I've heard it in Mexico. My cousin was talking, and then when I heard that sound, I said, are you talking from there? I forgot how it's called in Mexico. He taught me how to talk like that, and sis in the sixth grade, I mean, he's so old, so much older. Um, and she says, she goes on, but did, did, did he explain how to talk in there? What is it that you, what is it that you do? He says that you just mix Spanish with Maya. And I said, what? You can mix Spanish and Maya? He goes, it's easy. You just have to do this and that. But I don't remember how. Um, and do you know how to mix any other languages? What languages would you mix or thing that you mix? How do English and, and Espanol? ¿Cómo lo haces? How do you do that? Ay, es que nosotros, we invented a language, but a lot of people already use it. You speak first Spanish, then speak English, speak Span English, Spanish, and then a teacher told us that we speak Spanglish, right? So um, just um, to also be very clear here, I'm gonna end share here. Um, Yucatec Maya is not a language at risk. That is, there are enough speakers of the language in Yucatan to make it one of the most vital indigenous languages in Mexico. Um, you may recall that the terminology of indigenous languages includes the continuum from dead, dormant language to vitalization to the more political statement advanced by Leanne Simpson, a Mississauga and Nishanabek scholar, artist and activist, to think of language as language regeneration, as part of a political resurgence. To be sure today, global awareness of the importance of retaining, reclaiming, and supporting indigenous languages and its revitalization has taken an important turn. In 2019, the United Nations launched a campaign to promote the International um, Year of Indigenous Languages. Now without critique, as indigenous scholar and linguistic anthropology, Wesley Leonard noted, the rhetoric is still that still constructs languages within an alarmist and vanishing framework, providing no clarification of how world heritage languages, that what they're called, indigenous languages and their speakers continue to be exploited to serve the aims of knowledge and the good of the world. Similarly, Maliseet indigenous scholar anthropologist Bernard Purley from Tobique, New Brunswick, Canada, refers to this whole enterprise of language revitalization as zombie linguistics. The persistent use of metaphors and approaches to describe and study indigenous languages as dying and extinct, contributing to erasure even when efforts are being put in place to breathe life back into native languages and cultures. The Yucatan Peninsula was one of the first sites of colonization in the 15th century by Spanish settlers. The Franciscan friars took on the main Christianization campaigns that reduced people to landless experience through displacements and relocations and to minor statuses, literally wars of the state, uh, in the creation of doctrinas or boarding schools that, and, and the boarding schools that took place. So notions and practices of racial and linguistic purity persist today in the institutions and practices of settler colonialism. And I'll say that this travels in migration and that we're seeing a continuity, a continuation of the settler tactics and settler processes also in um, schools in California and elsewhere in the nation. Um, I just wanna mention a couple of things about, um, uh, let's see, um, it, tied to this displacement and this mobility has been a a history of linguistic insecurity. Language scholars who have been studying the grammar and communicative practices of Yucatec Maya speakers report in the literature that they find very common situations where speakers of the language do not believe that they are true speakers of the language. Armstrong Fumero notes, 
that an imaginary maya is the style that tends to constitute good, or what is called hach maya, um, or at least the language and belief that it represents good maya. Many scholars have written about the commonly heard phrases, the real maya speakers live just over there, illustrating expressions of nostalgia. In interviews with some of the mothers from Yucatan at Metropolitan Elementary, we heard this similar you know, expression of, of insecurity. Emma says, like I say to you, my Maya is the type of this Maya mixed with Spanish. It's not a real, real Yucateco. No, because there are words that we say some, sometimes and there are times that we get little bits of Spanish. It's not pure Maya, let's say. So at least for many adults in this community, like I, I just mentioned, notion of linguistic purity, travel and migration. This affiliation for Maya is common among adults, even though they speak Maya for everyday business at home. And as one of the first examples I presented today, there are often references to abuelos or grandparents, a filial loyalty to true Maya identity. Like they spoke, my grandparents spoke true Maya. They raised me. Yet these adults speak of those language skills while they were also raised by their grandparents and conceivably learning good through Maya, right? Um, so just to point out that the dynamics here are complex that um, they, you know, they, they feed into the school too, or the school feeds into it in particular at the school that I work with where um, now we have, um, you know, an advertisement of bilingualism in English and Spanish as an asset, but the true asset, you know, should be the revalorization of the indigenous languages that are already spoken at the school. I talk about um, supporting parents in their, you know, the education sovereignty uh, at the school in another publication, and I'm happy to also share that with you um, at a later time. So let me, let me move here, um, make a, a move back to how does this matter to us and you know, scholars in the language disciplines? Um, I want to connect the present moment that we're living is fueled by a growing refusal of anti-Blackness. Um, my own experience working in public schools with little or no support for indigenous students and by the need to change the way we do things as language scholars. So I want to, I want to connect these. Um, to do this, I need to speak from the field of my training, linguistic anthropology and applied linguistics, as I was still part of that program. Anthropology has had a problematic history, constructing a knowable other, one uh, what, that, the one um, that we can and should know, and the field grew out of largely deficit, comparative and racist debates involving language and culture. Franz Boas's work contributed to the establishment of method and practice in both linguistics and anthropology. And it was one of Boas's students, Edward Sapir, who began the study of native languages, both with the intention to understand and document the so-called dying languages. Um, well, much was um, recorded and documented under a last and best speaker of the language approach. Most of the material was used strictly for disciplinary debate and conversation. These extractive practices began to be questioned in the 80s and 90s when recordings made in wax cylinders, reel to reel and other portable devices began to be repurposed to support the relearning of indigenous languages. Many contemporary projects of indigenous language documentation are now online and available to support community projects of language restoration. Um, I note here the curated archives of the linguistics department at my own university and various language workshops, Breath of Life and other master apprentice programs. But there is always this sense of urgency and often our graduate students who are enrolled in fields like law, economic, physics. They are expected to support language revitalization efforts back in their communities and reservations, often with very little training. So I mentioned this because there's something we did as um, a way to 
um, challenge the institution to push forth different uh, different agendas. So in 2018, a couple years ago, a small group of us faculty members and students proposed a new program at the university, to the university, a doctoral specialization that would offer a critical interdisciplinary course of study and hands-on experience to examine processes of language eradication and revitalization. So this is the first graduate program of its kind at the University of California system, although the irony is not lost in us who started this program, that it begins in Berkeley almost 100 years after the first language documentation research took place with anthropologist Alfred Krober and an indigenous man who was given the name of Ishi, recording the sounds of Yahiyana, a vanishing language, Ishi's native language, until his death from tuberculosis in the halls of the, of the university. But we see our goal to be slightly different, to be different, a different commitment and responsibility to a more humane, relational and decolonial approach to indigenous language work, the kind of relational work that I mentioned in the land acknowledgement. So let me share again my screen and we can see some of the um, ideas I want to continue to talk about. Let's see. Right. So it appears at the institutional level, you know, some of the things that we can do with our work and our knowledge to support not just the students, but the communities that are going to be impacted by students' work, right? So the last few months have certainly been unsettling. Um, black students and academics took to Twitter, as I mentioned, Black Twitter and Black in the Ivory. Many of our taking for granted practices are being put to the test and invite us to ask whether, for example, our citation practices support or challenge assumptions that white Western male thought is superior, normalized and universal. And if we do change our citation practices to include scholars of color, that process cannot be tokenistic, right? Mere inclusion of voices is not enough the difficult task is developing a practices of being willing to learn and potentially transform our point of view through the engagement of work by Black, Indigenous, and people of color. During the George Floyd protests and the eruption of commentary and post and on Twitter, questions began to circulate. Where are the Black linguists? Are there any Black linguists? Ask most that were asked mostly by the newly woke white scholars who wanted to do anti-racist work. It is fine, there is always a way to get started. And the fact that, that we can point to a few who have been well legends in the field, like John Rickford, Sally Coco Mufene, John Bodd, Geneva Smitherman, and a few others is a very good thing. But the problem with this list is what we do with it. We consult these words when we want to double check the details of say black English or minoritized languages, not because we want to know linguistic theory from these authors, right? So this is the difference. And so that we are clear, there are linguists, linguists today, junior faculty who are um, infusing the field with incredible ways to think about language, think about minority languages as well. So I'm, I'm almost done here, but just as we examine our citation practices, we need to also be thoughtful about both the location and production of knowledge, starting perhaps with efforts to decolonize our syllabi, our courses, and write in our writing, asking ourselves who is at the center of our work and a process of decolonization that interrogates and dismantles the origins of our part and our participation in the sustainability of power structures that perpetuate racism, colonialism, and the biased production of knowledge. I want to point out here a, a findings from, and um, some of you might be familiar with this, a report led by Usri Bhattacharya, Lijiang, and Suresh Kanagaraja in 2019. This was a, um, a, a, an important AAAL meeting. And the report that came out of this 
um, on race representation and diversity in the American Association for Applied Linguistics is a good model for um, checking it against professional or our professional organizations. So at the end of their report, after they examine patterns in leadership, uh, recruitment, reviewing of conference papers, the journal, um, they say, they, they, they comment, we now return to the research question that motivated our investigation. The study revealed that scholars of color hold limited positions within the power structures of the association. In terms of meritorious scholarship, we also found that while scholars of color have contributed tremendously to the development of the field in applied linguistics, they are significantly less likely to be recognized for their scholarship within the association for 10 years. So Suresh was recognized and, uh, and, and Ryoko Kubota also after this um, intervention. Um, and they, they go on, let me, one more slide, sorry. There are several important questions that arise from these studies, such as how might the underrepresentation of scholars of color influence the kinds of topics scholars engage at AAA or within the field, the methods we employ in our investigations, what we consider data and the way we analyze data, we need to question further if this is leading to the reproduction of dominant voices in our intellectual endeavors. Um, there is much more to say, and I know I'm running out of time. So in, in closing, I, I have to confess that I am often wary of discourses of hope. The cynic in me always wonders, ah, whose motivations for hope? Whose goals of hope? But I tell you that this year, the complete destabilization in our world, it has always been unstable with permanent abuses to many communities. But the recent mobilization and uprisings in response to the killing of George Floyd, which is close to home for me in the United States, let, let bear the insidiousness of racism targeted to black, to the black body. I cannot, but truly hope. Hope that we can live through these times, hope that we can change institutions and our practices, and that this group, this summer school, convened to seek strength and direction from each other, gives us more than enough reason to continue to hope. So I thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about um, the comments and remarks that I made here today. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Patricia. Uh, it was really, thanks for such a fascinating sort of talk. And I think there's lots of uh, food for thought here and, and various threads that we can pick up on. And so, as a courtesy to uh, our viewers who may not be part of the summer school, so we are going to sort of allow a bit of time for, for a couple of questions, if there are any questions uh, uh, from the audience. So you can ask those questions in, in Spanish, English, or uh, Spanglish, or um, yeah, in any sort of way that you feel more comfortable with. I might answer in Spanglish but maybe others will ask too, so thank you. No question at this point. We are broadcasting in parallel, in parallel on Facebook, uh, but I think they don't. Kind of, they kind of ask, ask questions uh, if, if they're not um, on Zoom. Um, I mean, if, if there are no questions at this point, 
what we are going to do now is that we are going to move on to the sort of close part of this uh, session. Uh, yeah, there is, yeah, okay, there is a question here. Um, so Lorena Cordova is asking, Patricia, can you explain the concept of native diasporic consciousness? Yes. Um, thank you for asking. So I'll say just a little bit about, you know, um, why that concept is, how I came across this concept and why I think is helpful for me to explain the experiences of indigenous people who are also not from the United States or like the area of Native America, right? So um, I have been working with the concept of diaspora, transnationalism, hemispheric mo mobilities, and the work of Renia um, Ramirez as a professor at UC Santa Cruz has been looking at um, the ways in which landless Native Americans, like Native Americans in, in the United States, were also dis display, displaced um, when settlers arrived from uh, Europe and moved from east to west. And so, and they were also resettled. And there are a lot of indigenous Native Americans who are uh, living in cities, uh, some are living in reservations. And so what Professor Ramirez was doing was looking at the ways in which hubs were created. And these hubs, for example, at powwows, at celebrations that are rather ephemeral sometimes, two, three days, but they bring you know, hundreds of people together. And so these hubs are these parts, are, are processes of re-diasporizing, of creating community. And so in doing so, there is a sense that the native hubs also create a type of consciousness about nativeness, about place, about land, about remembering. Um, so that type of consciousness, I think is also operating in um, the mobilities and the migration from indigenous people in Yucatan. So similar events take place in the peninsula where there are um, celebrations in different towns and different communities and people move across, right, uh, locally, like regionally. And so some of that seems to also be happening here. And so I found that concept to be helpful for my work. So Lorena, did I answer your question? Or offer some way to answer your question? Yes. Good. Any other questions? Uh, we, we said before um, English or Spanish or Spanglish, but of course, if Portuguese or Portuñol is also fine, uh, we can translate here so we can work with what we have. Uh, so any other question? Because I see that there are here uh, participants who are not uh, PhD students involved in the summer school, so we, we can ask questions now. Adriana Patino Santos, thanks for your talk, Patricia. I'd like to hear a bit more about hope and your idea of transformation. Are you claiming for participatory research? And if so, I'd like to hear about hope and transformation in your current research. Thank you, what a great question. Yeah, you caught me there. Yes, um, I think that the reason hope is, so, so there is, and I, I am in the field of education and there, is a, there are different ways to conceptualize, conceptualize hope according to like different disciplinary frameworks. So psychologists think about it differently, right? Um, but in education, we have had um, a great deal of work on hope, on having a type of hope that is critical, that changes the conditions of students who are minoritized and racialized or labeled at risk too. 
So there's been, for example, the work of Jeff Duncan Andrade and um, other researchers who have been working more in participatory types of research projects where hope stops being this individual um, sort of Western uh, positioning and it's more of a community of a um, working together to change and challenge uh, the structures of uh, that, that impact students' uh, chances in education, right? So um, I think that I, I, I tend to think about, I always train to think or grew up thinking that hope is something that you have yourself, right? It's something that you build. Um, but, but, the, but the hope that I think is going to get us to change things is a hope, it's a type of hope that is both critical and constructed with others, like created with others, felt with others, supported by others. Is that how you are thinking of it too, Adriana? Adriana, if you want to switch on your camera uh, as a follow up, that's, that's fine too. Huh? Sorry to put you on the spot. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Hi, Patricia. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, yeah, definitely this is one of the things is um, when you think about the, the work we do as ethnographers uh, and we go to the field and we observe and we collect data or what we define as data, this is, this is always a kind, some kind of dilemma that we have, you know, to what extent we are there just, even being there we are transforming perhaps their practices, but to what extent this is part of, or this should be part of, of, the, of, of our own uh, obje objectives there or purposes there. And yeah, from the very beginning, this is basically, but I love the idea of critical hope. And I really, yeah, yeah, this is a very interesting concept. Yeah, that I'd like to, to explore, yeah, thanks. Yes, thank you, Adriana. If I may say too that you you mentioned something really, really important here, and that is the notion of transformation, and that is what puts like it turns the research um, assemblage on its head, because we have been so uh, trained and committed to be neutral, right? to have objectivity, to, ke to keep that distance, to be able to observe multiple angles. But the point of transformation is that not just for our very presence, because that is some kind of passive transformation, but active transformation, that we're doing research projects with an end goal. Right? So like that these are um, planned and uh, cannot be neutral ever. Right, they are commitments. So I think that that is what I what I what I uh, hear from you saying transformation too. Thank you. Yes, we have yeah uh, we have someone Gabriela Greenaway uh, asking. Thank you, Patricia. One question: Would you how would you go about decolonizing citations and finding non-white scholars for the work rather than uh, being tokenistic? Great question, Gabriela. Yes, it's a long process, right? I think it requires unlearning and it requires relearning um, of um, both mat content material, but also our own positioning. Uh, it's a bit of that transformation that we, I was just talking about before, that our part participation in the academy cannot be neutral either, right? That, um, that we bring to, to understand that we bring to our, our work um, biases that, that are learned, biases that are historical, biases that we can't even name because they're so deeply ingrained. Um, you know, we can think of um, um, lots of thinkers who are talking about that, you know, like the dispositions of our bodies, um, but, um, so it's a process of learning, it's a process of unlearning, it's a process of relearning. Um, and it's not going to be easy and it's going to be like, um, 
I'll use the word scary, especially for junior uh, faculty students even, because it might mean challenging, um, expected uh, use of citations, right? And one has to say, yes, I know that is a particular way, but can I see, can I know what other scholars are, how other scholars are seeing um, perhaps the same phenomenon or related phenomena? So, um, so it, will, it, will take, it will take time. All right. I think we we are going to sort of uh, pause here, and so that we can move on on to the uh, the second part of the session uh, with only PhD students involved in the summer school. So, so once again, Patricia, thank you very much uh, for your engagement also with, with the.